Hello, Jeff Disher here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about abstract data types because someone asked to know more about some of the graph algorithms based on one of the earlier talks from a long time ago. And this will give a lot of the background that's required to explain how some of those things work and, uh, and kind of what their underpinning components are. And this is in general useful and also explains how not everything in software is very technical. At the end of the day, it really does come down to trying to explain things in very high level common terms that people would actually understand. So it's often why you can explain things in non-technical ways, even though you're building a huge piece of software. So basically abstract data types, what they come down to is they're abstract, meaning that uh, we're really not interested in the implementation details. You'll just say, like, I need a, a list or I need a container of something. Um, doesn't matter how that's put together. Like that might matter from a performance point of view or based on the technologies uh, that you have at your disposal, but when you're thinking about the design of the software, it really doesn't matter in this case. This means it's all about just the capabilities and the interface. You'll s s talk about things like, okay, I need a kind of container that has these properties, like it keeps the, uh, the pieces of data that I put in it in order, or it puts them out of order in a certain sorted way, or it allows me to combine them with other, um, other containers in certain ways with certain properties. So this is all that matters from the point of view of an abstract data type. What is it you're actually trying to do? What do you need from a high level? So this means that it's all about high level terms and not too technical. You're only going to talk about the technical details of an abstract data type when you're worried about some of the implications of its implementation. Things like, what is the performance like? What's the memory footprint like? How do things like that work? But generally you're saying, I just want something that I can uh, add to or remove from, things that are very high level terms which don't really have technical meaning uh, beyond what everyone's normally used to thinking about. And generally they're not type specific. You tend not to think about this in terms of I need a container of a specific kind of data. Um, like that might matter, but generally when you're talking about an abstract data type you're not that interested in something that's specific to your environment. It's usually high level terms that you're going to use just to talk about how you're designing a large piece of software. So one of the most basic ones of these is a set. Now this of course comes from the basic mathematics, the uh, things like set theory and uh, Venn diagrams and all that where, where you can put things into a set and then you can intersect that set with others, uh, things like that. So very basic math. Basically it comes down to being a container without order. But it has certain other properties. If you add the same, if you add the number five to a set, it's now the set containing five. You add five again, it's still the set containing five. There's no duplicates within a set. And also, then you can intersect that with others. You can have things like a set that has two and five, and one that has five and six. You'll intersect those and get the set that has five. So again, the the basic math behind it. So the intersection is only the items that are in both, and the union is kind of the corresponding operation, which is uh, when you get two sets and you take their union, you get all the items that are in one or the other, but of course no duplicates. So again, that two and five and five and six example, the union of those would be a set containing two, five, and six. So again, it's like this, where you have this sort of Venn diagram looking thing. The green and the, the red are both individual sets. When you put them together like this, if you take everything that's in all of them, like both the red and the green and that middle part where they're overlapping, that's the union. If you take only the part where they're overlapping, that's the intersection. So another one that's common is a dictionary, uh, often called a map. And this is how you store information. It works much like a dictionary does. There's a name that has some data, but the definition. So you're storing a value for a key within, within the dictionary. But you can only store one value for each key. So typically you'll, you'll end up doing something like um, you'll put a piece of data inside it that has a key, and the key will be like the name often or something like that. Um, and then if you want to update that with new information, you'll, what you'll end up doing is replacing the data that was there for that key. So the key in many implementations actually is of a restricted type. Um, this usually doesn't matter because usually you do just want a string. Uh, quite often it is a name that you're using. That's, that's really a common idiom. So you often see this in, in dictionary or map implementations where there might be something restrictive about the key but not the value. So all accesses to this are by using the key. So you want to look up some data, you use the key. You want to try and uh, store some data or you want to remove some data, you all do it using the key. 
So it allows you to have a very simple piece of data that actually maps or resolves into a more complex piece of data. Most common example of this, of course, is a hash table. That's something you often use as the, the index in a dictionary, is the hash table. So you hash the key, and that's what you store in the table. And then the other thing the table has is uh, some way of looking up the actual value associated with that key. But it allows the, the interactions to be very fast. So of course, in this example, you have this dictionary that has red and green, and they both point to different objects. The red points to a red object, the green points to a green object. Um, so that's basically what these end up looking like when you think about them abstractly. And those are very common uh, for obvious reasons. It seems very simple. Uh, another one, which is one of the most fundamental and simple ones, is a list. Now, what's a list? Well, it's just a, an ordered collection of data. Basically, you have, uh, like any other list, you have things that are at the top of the list or the beginning, things are at the end of the list, and they, they go in order. The order is the important thing about the list. So you generally can do things like add and remove things by their index or by a start or end point. Uh, the order is defined, and that's what's important about a list. That's what uh, differentiates it from like a set or any generic collection. Uh, it's that things are in a specific order relative to each other, and that's important. Often, things which sometimes end up showing up as lists or might be implemented using lists are things like a stack, which is a last-in, first-out data structure, uh, a queue, which is a first-in, first-out data structure. I'm going to go into more details in these later because they're, they're the really important points. And with queues, you can have things like double-ended queues where you add and remove from both sides. Um, you can have things like priority queues, which are uh, queues which sort themselves. So you can, as you're adding information into it, they actually go into specific... Uh, the order they go into isn't just the end. It goes into a specific point within the list. And that's common for reasons as well. So again, it's just like this. It's this list of elements that are all numbered. They're all in a specific order, and that's what's important about the list. So to go into more detail about stacks and queues, because these are actually very, very important uh, abstract data types, and they're, they show up in a lot of cases, and for good reason. They give you very specific kind of semantic behaviors. So when you're talking about uh, if you need to keep a list of data, often what you're actually saying is, I need to actually be able to add or remove from this list uh, in a way that behaves like a queue, for example. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're using it just as a fast way of putting moving data around, but that's the that's a common idiom. So a queue is, again, like I said, a FIFO. First in, first in. First thing you put in is the first thing you take out. So in this example, we have a 0, 1, and 2, the underlying list under a queue. And you have the operations, which on a queue are called NQ when you're adding to it, or DQ when you're removing from it. So you see in this case, NQ adds to the end, DQ removes from the front. So there are two different points that you're changing with a queue. So if I put in the input of 0, 1, and 2, I get this list here. And then if I start dequeuing from it, I'll dequeue them in the order 0, 1, and 2 again. First in, first out, the order is preserved. Stacks, on the other hand, work differently. They're last in, first out. So here again, a similar kind of list that's underpinning the stack with the 0, 1, and 2 in it. And the operations on a stack are called push and pop. So when you're putting information on the stack, you're pushing it on. And then when you're removing it, you're popping them off. And these operate both on what's called the top of the stack. They both operate on the same end. So in this example, what it means is for your input, you're going to have 0, 1, and 2. But then the output's going to be 2, 1, and 0. If you push these all on first and then pop them off later, they actually reverse the order. Note as well, this is not to be confused with what is often referred to as the stack, which is uh, data storage used by a thread as it's executing. Um, it behaves like a stack, but it's kind of special. It's its own thing. Uh, as an abstract data, it is an example of the stack abstract data type, uh, but stacks are more generic than that. So. Anyway, that's some basic background on kind of those underlying abstract data types. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of ADTs if you really go into detail about it. But those are a lot of the fundamental ones. They give you an idea of how you think about uh, components of software without being too bogged down in, well, how does that actually work? So, no, it doesn't matter how it works. From the external consumer point of view, all that matters is what does it do? What capabilities does it provide for me? Because that's all I'm interested in. And that's how you simplify things as you grow out software. So the next talk, I'm going to go into some more details about uses of graphs 
uh, graph traversals and being able to find uh, things like shortest paths through graphs and that'll, that'll uh, kind of base itself on some of the information I've talked about here. Anyway, uh, if you have any other questions, send me an email, of course, or add a comment here, and I'll get back to you. Thanks.